Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Paddle Pursuit Podcast. I'm your host, Robert Norman. I'm here today with Jeff Wintercorn. Did I say that right? Yeah, you got it right. <laughs> Jeff heads up the Outrigger Paddling Club that is located in Chicago right now. Um, if you're not familiar with the Midwest, there is not a lot of paddle action going on in the traditional Outrigger canoe format. And uh, Jeff is kind of bringing that to the forefront in his area. Jeff, thank you so much for coming on the show with us today. Oh, it's awesome, man. Thank, thanks for having me. And, you know, I just want to say, you know, thanks for what you're doing, right? Like putting yourself out there is not easy. And it's it's awesome, man. I've, I've listened to a few of these podcasts now, some of the people I know. But it's cool. Like I'm learning stuff about them I didn't know. And I'm just learning stuff in general. So, I, you know, I just want to let you know I appreciate you and all you're doing, man. It's awesome. Absolutely. Thank you. And this is an opportunity for you to pay that forward and let the yeah. the general public know some cool stuff that you're doing. So give me a rundown on some of your background that led you into paddling and that progression in learning about paddling, taking it seriously as an athlete, and then ultimately becoming a coach. Yeah, no, um, sure. Uh, well, one, I mean, just growing up in, in the Midwest, you know, I was, I was just a water baby all the time, right? Like open water swimming, paddling, what, I mean, back then we would have called Indian canoes, windsurfing, water skiing. I, I was just always in the water. Um, but I think, you know, serious paddling really, um, it, it's, for me, it's really a tale of two cities. It started in Hong Kong um, in the early 2000s. You know, I was a rugby player traveling to Hong Kong a lot on business. My boss was living there and he paddled for a dragon boat team called the um, Titan Tigers. And so I, every time I was there, I was in the canoe and um, you know, the, they were old school, like teak canoes. They were heavy, you know, nobody had their own paddles. They were these wooden paddles. You know, you're just happy to get one that didn't break. Forget about what size it was, right? Like you're like, as long as they don't break, I'm happy. Um, but then really, in, I moved there in 2009, and I think that's when it got serious, right? That's when I found, I joined a really good dragon boat team while I was there, and, I, I, and I, that's where I found Outrigger Canoe, and that's really, I mean, if you ask me what I am, I'm an Outrigger Canoeist, but I, I still, I'll, I'll go to a dragon boat every now and then, but yeah, that's, that's, my, that's kind of my background, you know? What were some of the things um, that culturally picking up in Hong Kong and then as you've come back to the United States and interacting, are there major differences in like the club aspect and joining the club versus being overseas? Yeah. Um, I think like, like any place, um, like any, any, there's always something different culturally, but the great thing about Hong Kong was like, we raced every weekend. I was on the water all the time. There was, you know, there's races every weekend. There's tons of clubs in a really small area. And um, so it was, it was great. And everybody, like you get on the bus with a paddle in your hand, no one looked at you weird. Like, cause everyone paddled, right? Dragon boat was king. Outrigger was just, I mean, I was lucky to be there when Outrigger really started to pick up. It's just ridiculous how crazy it is and big it is there now. But um, yeah, I, like to me, it was just, it, it felt no, more natural. People weren't like, oh, do you row? It was just everyone, everyone knew what paddling was. Um, that like, to me, that was the biggest difference. And I remember when I moved home, my buddy from New York told me, he said, uh, he goes, listen, Jeff, paddling back home isn't the same. I didn't even know Dragon Boat teams existed in Chicago or Outrigger. And so when I moved back in 2013, 2014, I was just so stoked to find that there was an outrigger club, you know, like not far from where I live and, and a dragon boat club. So it was cool. That was great. So kind of walk us through starting in Hong Kong, transitioning back into the U.S. and some of the progression from that point onward with the outrigger canoe club and your role with it. Yeah. Um, so um, outrigger Chicago was started in 2012 and it was, um, it was a, uh, a guy named uh, the founders was a guy named Brian Jeffries. He paddled at NAC for a real long time. He, he moved back. He moved to the Chicago area with his, or his wife. She was from here. Uh, a guy named Mark Moroz, who was, um, he actually won the solo in like 2016. Of Pol I mean, you know, Chicago's got a ton of really good Polish, Eastern European paddlers, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of, a lot of strong uh, C1. I, I'd call it high knee, but, you know, really strong paddlers in Windy City. 
Um, and then a guy named Tim, Tim Fulton, he was, he actually, I think was the founder of Windy City Dragon Boat Club. And he used to run a surf ski race up here in the, in the, in the early, in like 2011, 2012. Mm -hmm. Um, but they started a club to, to race Catalina. And, um, so I came back, actually, I met them all in Hong Kong at a Dragon Boat race. I was standing in, you know, in the shoots. I was standing there. I look over and I'm like, are you guys from Chicago? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, I'm from Chicago. Right. And I just started <laughs> chatting them up. And it was funny. I remember I turned to my team and I go, oh, we're going to smoke these guys. And uh, we got to the start line and they killed. I mean, the Windy City team just smoked us. And uh, so I every time I came back, I just I, I'd go to their practices. I'd start hanging out with them, call them. And I knew eventually I was moving back. And so I just wanted to build that connection with them. Um, and so like in 2014, I moved home, um, and I, you know, I, I started, started paddling Dragon Boat Windy City and paddling Outrigger Canoe with, uh, Outrigger Chicago, you know, and, um, yeah, but that time the Outrigger Club, we were small. It was like nine guys. We were 100% focused on us. We were really good paddlers. We wanted to do big races, you know, um, and, and we didn't, there wasn't a lot of room for new people. You know, um, but we, we did some good stuff, right? We, we go out to Liberty every year. We did uh, Molokai Iho um, once, tw well, twice. Um, one time is Outrigger Chicago. One time is, is the Polish team. But yeah, it was pretty awesome. It was cool. It's been fun. What has been the progression having nine people and developing now, having multiple boats, a larger club, larger outreach, kind of walk us through uh, humble beginnings to where it is today? Yeah. Um, I, for me, I think the change probably started around, um, 2017. So we, we had done, we, we did, we did Molokai the, the, the year in 2016. And, um, that next year, um, there was some changes made and some guys decided to do it with a, a different group. And it, uh, you know, left, it left me and this guy Olaf, uh, you know, kind of out of it. Right. And at that time I realized, okay, we, we gotta, we gotta, you know, we, we gotta bring other people into the sport, right. There was no room for, for other people. Uh, if I'm, if I'm honest, I was a little hurt <laughs> by it. And I just started paddling alone. Um, and then around 2020, um, I, I was at a race. We put on a race here, surf ski, outrigger, small boats. And uh, we had our big canoe sitting on the beach and people were a bunch of sub paddlers were asking about it. And I was like, yeah, let me take you out. And they got super into it. And, and that's where I was like, okay, we got to start building. You know, we, we got to start with just newbies. We got to create a space that's welcoming and open and, you know, just, it, it just it can bring other people into the sport. And so we just been, we've been growing it from there. I've been, I've bought a couple of canoes now and donated them to another club. So we, there's actually three outrigger clubs in Chicago now, which is pretty cool. Um, but yeah, just realizing that it, ha it couldn't be about me or us anymore. We had to create it something to bring others in. Does that make, does that make sense? Yeah. The, um, Starting a club, one of the toughest things for a lot of people is literally that catering to the people that are fast from a competitive standpoint, that's yeah. the way to go. Cause like that's your race team, they're committed, they're gonna be there. But making space for people to become those competitive people, that's the kind of the blueprint that you have to set out. That's why Dragon Boat is so popular. Cause you can allocate six seats to brand new people and they're not gonna right. like ruin a boat versus even the outrigger canoe, like in the OC6. It's tough allocating one or two seats to first timers and taking away from, you know, that competitive aspect. So making sure that you can allow them those first 10 or 15 practices to blossom and not scare them away in that first phase is super important for the growth. Yeah. So um, looking at taking in new paddlers and building them up. Tell us about some of that transition from having nine solid guys, everybody's doing what they need to, then making that pivot into like, hey, we got to start with somebody that doesn't know how to pull, hold their paddle the proper way and going through the stroke and timing and kind of walk us through guiding people through that journey. Yeah, well, it, it, well it's interesting because it all depends on the people's backgrounds, right? Mm -hmm. So when you get dragon boaters, right, they what they understand is the team aspect. 
but it I tend to have to spend more time with them on like the stroke and how to how to move water because you know when you're in a when you're in a boat with like 20 people you always think you're better than you are <laughs> and that's why I love the OC1 right because it's like it's you it's it's not the canoe it's not the paddle it's you um but like with sub paddlers they tend to know how to move water well but they don't know how to be i tend to have to spend more time with them helping to be a teammate right like because they don't they're used to being alone they're used to looking around they're used to like and so there's a little bit little bit of differences and i always love it when we get people that have no background and they're just like holy cow, what is this thing? It looks amazing. And I'm like, well, jump in. Let Here, here's a paddle. Let's let's go out and try it. And I tell you, we get two miles offshore and we look, you know, a mile, we look back and you see the Chicago skyline and people just are like, holy cow, like, this is amazing, right? Because maybe they've never been offshore before, you know? Yeah, the uh, that paradigm of the individual versus the group when you look at like Team USA Dragon Boat, it seems like the way that they would rather the approach is having the paddler that can move a single boat efficiently, then figure out how to get them into sync versus the opposite. So there's so much emphasis on that OC1 time trial now yeah. that wasn't there in the past. Before it was like, if you're a team player, that's what gets you in the boat. Now being solo and trying to figure out how to paddle in sync second seems like that paradigm shift on a large scale. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. You, you brought that up. Cause I'm, I'm definitely, I mean, I'm always about team, the team, right? Like, and I would rather have, I would rather have six great teammates than have the six best individual paddlers mm -hmm. because especially in the OC, it is all about like just connection, connecting to each other, right. Connecting to the canoe, connecting to the water. And it's, I can always get, and that's actually my focus right now for the team. You know, it's like, let's build a great community, a great network. Let's be great teammates and work hard and, and eventually podiums will come, but let's connect first. Right. So you're, you're right. I, I do. And I, I went through team USA in 2017, mm -hmm. but I mean, to me that, that I was on senior a, right. That team was so good because we were so connected to each other. I, some of those, I'm still friends with that most of that team. And like, they're just, you know, it, it, they, we were super tight, right? Yeah, looking at um, the club dynamic on a day-to-day -day basis, like we run the club here in Hernando and yeah. I've talked with a couple OC6 clubs, um, having that that group unity trumps all, right? Like yeah. that's the thing that, that's the fabric that holds everybody together. Performance is not usually the thing that, motivates people to come day to day but it's that feeling of belonging and that ohana that's the thing yeah. that gets people really hooked on the sport for the long term so when you're yeah. trying to balance that successful club versus a successful racing team it's almost two dynamics that you have to balance and cater to yeah oh 100 agree right like and it's you know and i'm also at this point now in my career where i just want to be in the canoe with people i like you know what i'm saying like and i know we'll figure it out but if we don't like each other it'll be it'll it'll be i remember one one year jeff coon and i put together a team we I, jeff, jeff called it, it was the dead presidents outrigger he, he always <laughs> named his he had this dead presidents and it was a great group of paddlers but there was a little bit of you know we literally thought we'd go there and win, but there's there, you know, there was some, there was some difficulty in the canoe and I just, we couldn't bring it together. And, uh, you know, but you got to get that, you know, you, you got to get people working together. Right. Like, so it was interesting. So looking at the club dynamic and then pivoting, like training new people, getting them into the boat and then finding that athletic outlet of races. Tell us about being in the Midwest. There's not a, huge region of OC6s that you can paddle with without going all the way to the East Coast or even Chattajack growing helps a lot, um, yeah. bringing kind of a central location, but uh, kind of talk about some of the race outlets that you guys do have in that area. Yeah. So we have, um, we have a race series in the Midwest. So it's um, Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Michigan, mm -hmm. and it's called the Midwest Paddle League. And it's, it started as a sub series. So a guy named Doug, um, I don't, I, I don't actually know who started. It was a bunch of individual races and Doug decided, Hey, let's make this a series. 
and he sponsors the points. And uh, one of the races is beach to beach. It's our home club's race. Kathy, uh, Kathy McCray puts it on and, and I, I've been helping her. And uh, we, we entered OC ones into that race. And then we reached out to Doug and we're like, Hey, can we start bringing OC ones to the other races? And he created a category for us. And um, you know, prior to that, me and the guys were always racing on somewhere else. We were flying to the coast. And I was like, look, we've got to support local racing, right? We, if, if we don't, we like, how do new people come in? They're not going to get on a plane and fly. You know, they don't have the resources. So we, you know, our goal right now is we will support the local races. You know, we'll show up with canoes, you know, and we want our team members. Those are a races for us, because if we don't support the local scene, we have nothing, right? Like, cause that's all we were doing. We were traveling, you know, I mean, I'm lucky. I, I was traveling all over the world paddling, but, but I, we, you know, again, if I'm, if I'm going to, if we're going to develop the sport in this region, we've got to support the local races. So that's our, that's our goal right now. Yeah. And I think you guys are actually ahead of the curve on that uh, compared to us in Florida right now, where we have a whole bunch of clubs, right? But we yeah. only have a couple of outlets for racing. We have the Clearwater Classic and Nish Pombo. And Nish Pombo pulls in a lot of people. Yeah. But for us in Florida, it's one of last year is one of two major OC6 events, right? So we haven't really gotten the ball rolling on sustaining some of these races that used to be in the spring, in the summer. They disappear. And now there's not a huge um, race scene for that. And like you said, when you build up people and they spend time, honing a skill they do want to showcase it so if they're only practicing and they don't get the opportunity to race it diminishes yeah. their uh motivation within the sport so supporting local it goes a long way no matter how flourishing a region is yeah no i and i i agree with you with your point about racing like people want to race they may not want to get on podiums but like you got to have something to work for mm -hmm. and and that's where the local that's where the racing helps but the local racing is really good. And, you know, I have a, I have a vision of having, you know, an, an OC six change race in, in Lake Michigan. Um, you know, we're, we're building up to it slow right now. We do, um, we have a small, a small race. It's just local clubs. We've done it two years in a row now, just learning, you know, how, how to do it, <laughs> how to run a race with big canoes, um, and working, you know, every, everything's a little bit harder in the city of Chicago, <laughs> you know, um, so learning, learning how to work those channels, but, um, you know, one fingers crossed one of these days, I'm hoping to, hoping to get a big race with, with teams from all over coming in. So, yeah, if you build it, they will come. One of the cool things with, uh, California, um, besides having all the infrastructure with the clubs and the attendance to run races is uh they have three seasons they have nine man yeah. season they have iron season and then they have small boat season yeah. and they cycle through all of that so having some sort of yearly structure no matter what it is as long as it's structured people can plan their life around it right they can plan their yeah. training schedules hey the water thaws out and this date and then we have a race on this date we can start training for it but if you don't have that infrastructure there's no motivation to get people out there and especially with new people, it's like just a little fire goes a long way in getting them to take those first few steps. Yeah, for sure. But I, I feel like, I mean, I feel like the East Coast is really starting to build, even Florida. I mean, like I said, I moved back in 2014 and it's been amazing to see the growth of the sport up and down the, up and down the coast. Right. So, uh, and again, a lot of my team is like, Hey, let's go race in California. I'm like, no, let's go race on the East coast and support that it's closer. We can get our canoes there. Like we we've been down to niche now the last two years. And it's, you know, I love that race. I love, you know, you know, I love what Christian's doing down there and, and seeing everybody. And, you know, I'd love to figure out a way maybe to enter a few more of those Florida races. Like maybe if they're a little closer, we'd leave the canoes down for a couple of weeks or I don't know something. We'll figure it out. So uh, one of the nice things with the podcast that we're trying to showcase is the synergy between different sports, right? Yeah. So even though people paddle in a different style or format, we're all in the same paddling world. And when one is successful, the other is successful. So being near one of the, the most successful Dragon Boat clubs in the country with Windy City, what is it like interacting with Dragon Boat clubs 
and trying to get some of those people interacting into the outrigger scene and like what is the approach on like getting people interested in that do you have a high conversion rate is it something people aren't interested in what's your perspective been on dragon boat into the oc world <laughs> oh boy i'm gonna get myself in trouble here <laughs> perfect that's good for radio <laughs> well i mean the first part i'll say if i get you in the canoe i guarantee i'll keep you in the canoe because there is nothing like so a, a couple of years ago um I teamed up with, there's a, uh, there's a club called greater Chicago dragon boat club, right? John McDermott, um, is, is the coach there. And, you know, he was really interested in raising the level of his club and he'd reached out to me and said, Hey, we're doing time trials. Could you come and just coach our paddlers on, 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 um, how, how to do a time trial in an OC one. And I was like, ah, Oh yeah, sure. I'll, you know, I'll come. And, um, I actually had a blast. It was, I had fun doing it. And so I reached out to John and I said, Hey, I got this opportunity to buy two OC sixes. If I did, and I donated them to you, do you think you, you would, do you think you guys would use them? And he was like, yeah. So I, I bought these two canoes out, out in uh, Lake Tahoe and uh, John and I and our buddy Don got in my car and we <laughs> drove all the way across the country, picked them up, drove them all the way back. And we started um, the, the second Outrigger Club called 312 Outrigger. And it was interesting because some of my teammates were a little, a little mad at me. Like, why are you starting another club, right? Like, what you're, you're taking paddlers away from us. And um, I mean, it sounds real, like, you know, great. Like, oh, yeah, I, I donated. But it was actually really selfish. And the whole point was, I want to race someone in an OC6. And I don't want to travel. And the only way to do that is to help another club get started. Um, and, 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 and that, that, that's what, that's what we did there. So um, I, I guess I got a little off your original question, but so the difference <laughs> with Wendy, so dragon boating and outrigger, like in Hong Kong, they were friends. Like if you mm -hmm. paddled outrigger, every dragon boat club wanted you because they just knew you could move water. And so if you missed a dragon boat practice, cause you were on paddling outrigger, nobody cared. Right. Like, but it, in Chicago, it was it was different, right? Like I got in a lot of trouble with my coach at Windy City because he'd be like, "Hey, you 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 miss practice." I'm like, "Yeah, but I just did 25 miles out on the lake, right?" Like, <laughs> and so there's there's a little bit of conflict between dragon boat clubs and 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 outrigger. I I think that's starting to go. I think that's starting to go away. Um, I'm I'm trying to make it go away because I do think I do think. Um, Dragon Boat Clubs, the smart ones want should recognize that having their paddlers in smaller boats will help them. Um, so, but it's still hard. I mean, there's there's politics. Like, I mean, every sport I've been in, there's politics between the clubs. So, um, but yeah, I mean, that's. I, I wish I wish we were worked a little more. You know, I wish we were a little more friendly, worked a little better. But you know, I it's not going to stop me from trying it. So, <laughs> yeah. And I think over time, um, that stigma will resolve itself yeah. everywhere. And even five years ago, um, you, you could listen to people and it's like, Oh, if you paddle out rigger canoe, it will mess you up for dragon boat. That was the big stigma. And then yeah. it's like, Hey, let's do OC time trials. And that changes. Like if what, yeah. however the hell you're paddling an outrigger canoe, we want that in our team boat. And it, it helps with that. Um, you know, that synergy. And like you said, whenever you have a cross town, anything that takes away from the idea of yeah. participation, if people are running it like a business, then they see it as like, you know, a personal attack on what they're trying to do. And like you said, it, the more synergy, no matter how you're moving a vessel, if you're paddling a surf ski or an hour canoe, we're in the same world together at the same event, doing a very similar thing. So when one is successful, if Dragon Boat is successful, means outrigger canoe can be more successful and those two piggyback on each other if they work together yeah so looking at the the team building getting in new paddlers kind of walk us through having a paddler they get in the oc6 and then is there a facilitation into getting them into the oc2s and the oc1s and what is your role in guiding people from the big boat into the small boat yeah. So, um, I mean, my favorite way to get people into paddling and I, I recently just bought, I, I bought an OC two, 
um, because I think the best way is to put them in the OC2 first. So, mm -hmm. you know, they're with me or an experienced paddler. Um, so they feel a little safer and you can just talk them, talk them through. Right. And um, spend a little time, you know, spend a little time, a little more one on one. Um, we will sometimes we'll double. We've got five. There's five OC. Wait. Yeah, there's five OC sixes right now in Chicago. Um, on the south side, um, we'll double haul canoes. We we have a we have two canoes that we can double haul, which is a great. It's a great way to put you know novices in um, and control it. But I definitely like going the OC two. Get people in the OC six. Um, you know, I want to know things in Lake Michigan is pumping. I mean, some days it's flat like glass. There's days it's just pumping. And so we, we always have to be a little bit careful. Like I want to know before you get in the canoe, I want to know if you can swim, if you can tread water, you know, if you're afraid of water, um, you know, and, and, you know, if, 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 if you can't swim, then you, you know, you got to wear a life jacket. We've always got life jackets, but you know, it's, if, if you're afraid of open water and I'm, surprise there's a lot of people that are um you know you gotta you gotta know i i want people to know they can swim first um and and get back in the canoe right like that's another one um but yeah typically we'll start out and lots of times it's pretty it's pretty in the mornings it's mel it's kind of mellow and the lake will build with time if there's storms so we'll get people out there and uh, i'll usually if i'm steering i'll put them in seat five in front of me so I can watch, they can watch others and I can just give them a little feedback. And, you know, it's always start with timing first, right? Watch, watch the others start with timing, you know, um, yeah, we'll talk things through the beach. So let me say this, Robert, you know, like I'm new at my coaching journey and I, I, I like, I'm a great motivator in a canoe. And I think that's why I end up, I, I think I, I fell into coaching because you know, I'm not afraid of kind of being a leader. And, and I just, I, I knew a lot, right. I've been paddling since, you know, since, since the early 2000s, mid 2000, you know, and, but where I'm, it's the most challenging thing I've ever done. I know how to do things, but then to be able to tell someone, look what they're doing and say, you know, okay, you got to do this, you got to do that. And so I've been trying to learn from a lot of, a lot of people. Right. And it's, you know, some days I feel like I'm letting my team down and, and they're because they want more from me. Right. Like I one of our paddlers, she said to me, she's awesome. She goes, Jeff, you're a great motivator, but I need you to tell me when I'm not doing something right. You know, and I struggle with that because I don't I don't I it's hard for me to criticize because my job forever has been to like motivate you and get you pumped. Um, so so I'm learning. I've been reaching out, you know, Paulo, right. I've been reaching mm -hmm. out to yep. him. He was. um you know, he, he was my coach in 2017 and, you know, just asking him for advice and, and others, I come along. Right. And I, you know, I listen to podcasts and you said something the other day on a podcast, what I loved, which was you could say something to someone, right. And they won't understand it. And then someone else will say something in a different way and it connects. Mm -hmm. Right. And like, that's one of the things. And I think Paulo told me that too. That's one of the things, like when someone's not understanding what I'm trying to say, I try to describe it a different way, you know? Um, and sometimes, sometimes that, that, that helps, but for sure, I just, I need to get better. If, like my challenge right now is being, is that making that conversion from a paddler to, uh, you know, to a coach and it's, it's not, it's, it's channel. It's super challenging. <laughs> <laughs> For most coaches, it seems like the origin story is kind of like you said, where it's like the role presents itself out of necessity more than yep. like, you know, like we need to find the best coach. It's We just need to find somebody that will assemble everybody. And like you said, keep them motivated and keep morale high to keep them coming. And the technique side, it's always a challenge. Um, a lot of the YouTube videos and the online school, all of that is based on trial and error, meeting hundreds of people in person saying something to them yeah. and just seeing the deer in the headlight look and then it's like oh man like you've got to do it different so you have like visual learners you have conceptual learners you have yeah. people that have to do it you know kinetically to figure it out so some people like they're just they don't get it until you just grab them and yank them around and yeah. other people you can describe it and they visualize it and put it together in their head right and so kind of covering all those bases helps tremendously on reaching the most amount of people 
right? Most yeah. paddlers that are very good individually struggle to rephrase it for somebody else because they only have to learn it for themselves. So I only need yeah. to explain it one way, the way that I know it, and then explaining it for somebody else. Like, if you're not coaching, you don't have to, like, waste your time. You just, yeah. you've already mastered it. You move on to the next thing. So yeah. that coaching struggle is learning something that you know 10 more times because you've got to yeah. learn it every which way to show it, tell it, do it, et cetera. Yeah, no, I, I love that. And that's, that, that's exactly it. So that's what I'm, I'm trying to do. And, um, you know, the other thing that I think is really helpful too, and I want to do more of it this year is, is like video, right? Like you can tell somebody something a hundred times, but when they see themselves, what they're doing, right. Um, it just clicks. Right. And the same thing, like sometimes we'll sit on, on shore and I'll have one person in the canoe taking strokes and I'll ask people, hey, what do you see, right? Like, and I make them describe what they see. And it's, it's you know, it's, it's, it's cool because we all kind of learn, we're all trying to learn together, you know, if that makes, if that makes sense. Um, I got a funny story for you just on necessity, right? Like, because, you know, I'm like a 200, you know, maybe 200, 205 pound, you know, ex-rugby player. And so that's normally not the person you want in seat six. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> And, 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 and like, it was funny because someone asked me the other day, well, how'd you first learn how to steer? And it was totally out of what you just said, necessity. We, we were doing a race and uh, we were, I was in Hong Kong at the time. My club was Royal Hong Kong Yacht Club Outrigger. And we were racing the San Miguel Cup, which is in Singapore. And it was a team of just a bunch of big guys and our steers person couldn't make the race. And so basically what they did the captain, this guy, Roger Holmes, said, okay, we're doing a time trial and the slowest time trialer is steering. <laughs> and I lost the time trial. Like, <laughs> and so I literally had a week and a half to learn how to steer a canoe. And next thing I know, and then, you know, luckily, you know, I, we had a lot of practices and I did, I did pretty good, but like, it was total lot of necessity. I find myself at a start line steering a canoe. I mean, it was crazy. Right. So. Yep. And that's, it's the same all over when um, I got the dragon boat to start the club. Somebody's got to steer the damn thing. And it's like, well, <laughs> let's go out there and just, I wrote my name in cursive on the lake a hundred times yeah. before I got the hang of it. OC, we get the OC six. We all look at each other and it's like, well, time to learn. Yeah. He went out there yeah. and just did circles for a while. So uh, speaking of OC six steering, walk us through, have you taken a new person, got them in the boat? taught them to steer what is some of the challenges with getting somebody into seat six and getting them to kind of yep. enjoy it so uh so two two points right the first one i always tell my team is the easy part of steering in canoe is making it go right and left the hard part about steering a canoe is taking responsibility for those five lives in that canoe right like to me that's that's the hard part um but i take i make everyone in our club steer like they have to at least steer once. Um, and it's, you know, we'll do it towards the end of practice if it's, if it's really a new person, because, you know, you're, that canoe can get crazy. Um, but everyone knows they got to steer the canoe. And I'm usually either in seat five or I'll sit behind, like in somebody called seat seven, I'll sit in seat seven right behind the steers person and just talk them through it. Um, I also have like, a, I have like a an online before you get in the canoe to try to steer. I just kind of have this, you know, um, I do it online just because it's easy with presentations, but just kind of helping people understand like the forces that um, the forces that affect the canoe, right? So they can be thinking about it. Um, but when I put them in, I'm like, all I want, I say, just poke. I don't want you to do anything else, right? Just, you know, poke, see what happens, right? Let the canoe run then poke, see what happens, like, just see how the canoe reacts, learn, right? And then, and I, I literally have steps. And then I'm like, okay, now I want you to try to um, be proactive, right? Think about before the canoe reacts, I want you to react, right? And, you know, eventually we'll get to like draw strokes and, but I'll, I'll say, I'm really excited. We had um, at Nish this year, we had our first women's team race. And it was a steers woman who started this year. That was her first ocean race. And she did awesome. Like I was super proud of her. And I had a backup steers woman in the canoe for her, just in case. But race day, she's like, her name's Shelly White. She's awesome. She's like, I, I'm going to do it. 
and she did it and she did awesome. And I, I was just super proud, super proud of that team. Right. Like, and they didn't, you know, they, they, they didn't get on a podium, but they, they worked together as a team. They finished the race. I think they did well. And they just showed up in a way that they can be proud of. And I can be proud. like, that was our goal for Nish, right? Like, let's be the team that people are like, man, those people are awesome. I like those people. They're good. They helped me. They did this, right. They were super positive, right. That's, 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 you know, that, that was our goal this year. And, you know, I think if we keep doing that and working hard, we'll, we'll get on podiums one day. Yeah. I, I like to describe ladies as being smarter with their risk assessment, right? So like ladies will weigh, what is the risk? And then what is the reward? And then decide yeah. like, oh, it's yeah. too risky, right? So like yeah. you said, when you steer a boat, the thing that wicks people out is the safety of the five people. So that's a yeah. major risk assessment. Most guys don't give a crap. They're just like, no. whatever, like, let's do it. No. Versus ladies are like, oh my God, like, you know, these people can, you know, they can perish if I mess up. So it's hard to get that initial confidence in ladies specifically for that role. Like whenever you look at steersmen, there seems to be more guy steersmen naturally, right? And it's hard to find that right personality to take that seat because they have to take control of the boat. They have to take responsibility for their team. Yep. And there's a lot that goes into that. And like I said, risk and reward, eh, it's too risky. I don't want to do it, right? So that's awesome that you've been able to cultivate a uh, female steersman in-house there. That's that's very tough. Oh, yeah. Well, and it's, I mean, it's such a leadership position in the canoe, right? I mean, you know, and it's, you, you, if you don't trust your steers, if the crew doesn't trust the steers person, bad things happen. If the steers person doesn't trust the canoe, bad things happen, right? And so, like, to me, it's just, you got to keep working with each other and build that trust. And I, you know, I say it all the time. I go, eventually, we're going to get to the point where we don't even have to talk in this canoe because we're just so, we just know each other so well. And that's what I want, right? It's just like, let's get out there. And But that's where, you know, where we started this it's building that connection with each other, right? Like if you don't like the people you're with in the canoe, well, how do you trust them? You know what I'm saying? Like, so to me, that's, that's where it starts, right? It starts on the beach long before we get in the canoe. The, um, the idea of putting everybody into seat six is awesome because it builds, yeah. it builds empathy, right? Cause you get back oh, there yeah. and it's like, you stop complaining about your steersman. Once you figure out what it takes to like, to control the boat like the the boat has so much personality as they say that like in hawaii the, the canoe has a spirit and it has yeah. its own you know and it's because that thing is just affected by wind and tide you can take it out five days in a row and it'll do five different things because it's kind of a finicky configuration on a boat and it's hard to wheel right and uh, that helps with that empathy in having people do it and nobody does well on the first try, right? And like right. kind of going through what it takes to do that and the responsibility. So if they're up front, the canoe goes off a little bit. They're like, I get it. Like, I understand what's going on back there. Yeah. Well, and you see, I think as a paddler, if you've never steered before, you're, you're anytime that something happens with the canoe, you're like, oh, what's the steers person doing? Mm -hmm. But once you steered, you realize how how seat one and two can have such an effect on what the canoe's doing if they're not pulling water straight back, you know, and like in currents and tide and just, and there's so many forces acting on the canoe, you know? Um, and so, yeah, yeah. I, I love getting people just like you said, just uh, even if they're not going to be steers people, at least they get an appreciation. But when the club's small, you know, if you don't have someone who can steer the canoe, you might, it might be the difference between practice and no practice. Right. And when it was just me steering, if I, you know, if something happened, you know, I've, I've got daughters that play high level sports. If I, if I'm going to watch their sport and I can't be at practice, then, then there's no practice. Right. So it was, it was a huge um, team goal last year to get multiple steers people. We're up to about, I think we're up to about five right now. And I, we built a program. Like we have a ranking for our steers people um, and like levels to get there. Um, and, you know, so it's cool. We're like, we're trying to, you know, we're trying to build it, like put it together, create, like build a system, if that makes, I'm in manufacturing, right? So that's where, <laughs> you know, and I'm, I got an engineering background. So it's always about the system, right? Not about, you know, can we build a system that helps others like really um, perform? 
So um, I had uh, gotten this information from the person that asked me to interview you. Uh, you're participating in the Va'a Sprints in Hawaii this year, right? That's yeah. on the docket. So speaking yep. of a boat being affected by current and being unruly, the Va'a, right? Tell us yeah. about OC1 and then the transition to Va'a. When was the first time you were in a boat with no rudder and kind of walk us through that, um, you know, discipline? Yeah, so uh, so the funny thing is my first outrigger canoe was actually uh, a Maui canoe, bah, like rudderless canoe. Like, And I, I didn't know much about paddling. Some guy was selling a canoe. Me and my buddy were like, oh, and it was hard to get canoes in Hong Kong back then. So we just bought it, right? And, mm -hmm. and you know, this thing was like, I was like, oh, wait a minute, what's going on here, right? Like, um, so it was interesting. That was my first canoe. I, I quickly got a ruddered canoe because I just, I could barely control it. Mm -hmm. um, but I, you know, I, um, so just in Hilo, I'm, I'm on, I'm doing um, the six man. Um, okay. I'm in the gotcha. six man. So it's not the, 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 uh, the one man, but I definitely am interested when I was down at Nish, I was in Pam's boat and mm -hmm. I was, I was having a blast. She let me take it out. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking for, I'm looking for one, um, so we'll, we'll, we'll see. I was talking to Joey recently. So um, I'm definitely interested in getting a rudderless because I think, you know, a lot of it, you know, I used to do, like I said, when I was young, we were paddling canoes and, and it was the same thing, right? Like you had to do J strokes, jaw strokes, like, you know, you're controlling the canoe. So yeah, I think it'll be, I think it'll be fun. Yeah. Having the background of steering an OC6, um, yeah. there's a lot of skills that translate over. Uh, yeah. And the Va'a, the hull is faster. So it's funny to think like the speed potential on the Va'a is much higher, but now you have like, you're driving stick shift and the automatic is gone, right? So you're yeah. in control of yeah. all those little new, and it's, there's a huge surge of it. ARE um, with uh, Joey Alvarez, right? Bringing them in. Yeah. Um, Phi Va'a being uh, manufactured by Ozone. Those are going to get printed out fast. So there's two yeah. major brands that are coming um, into the domestic US now. And then with a uh, international outlet, right, hopefully people race domestically and then they can take it to a world championship level. So um, the races over in uh, Hawaii, uh, they're regatta style, right? So you're going down, making yep. the turn and whatnot. Kind of walk us through. Uh, I don't think we've talked about regatta style OC6 racing before on the podcast. Yeah, um, well, I did a lot of it uh, when I was in Hong Kong. We There was this race in Australia in the Whitsunday Islands, Hamilton Island. And uh, I think it was called Clash of the Paddle. And it was a week long outrigger event. And you'd have small boats, big boats, irons, changes, and there was a sprint race in there. Mm -hmm. And we'd, we'd sprint small, you know, small boats, and then also, you know, sixes. And um, I mean, it's literally, it's amazing and fast and, and crazy, like, it's just, it's so much fun. So basically you start off and when, and there we did um, one, two, we did three turns, mm -hmm. right? And uh, you go down and you got to keep the AMA, you know, on, on, you, you, it's an AMA side turn, right? And you got to keep the AMA on the right side of the buoy. But sometimes when you're going down there and you're trying to turn that thing fast, that AMA will pop and land on the wrong side. And then you got to circle back around again. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and, and go, and I remember we were, we were winning a race and that happened to us in the last turn. AMA pop landed on the bad side of the buoy. There's a photo of us. You could see us all. We're like, our faces are like, oh. And uh, we had to go back around. I, I, I still think we took third in that final. But um, yeah, I mean, it's, but it's, it's very different it's like, it's very aggressive and fast, right? It's like you go, my experience, it's like you go anaerobic, like instantly, and you just got to be able to hold it there. Right. And, and, you know, there's definitely, there's strategy around turning. Right. Um, and I don't think there's a right or a wrong. I, I I've seen good teams execute all different styles, right. Whether the uni or whatever, it's like, um, it's, it's pretty cool. So I, I actually think, I, I think it'll be re really fun, especially like with juniors. I think that's the path to get juniors in because no parent wants to go to a race where they can't see their kid, right? Like, it's like, oh, they jump in the canoe, you know, an hour, maybe two hours later, they come back. Right. And, mm -hmm. and so I, I feel like for juniors, that's, that's, that would be a great path in, right? Like get them in the canoe 
get their parents excited about it, get some races going. And I think that's what, I think that's what Joey's trying to do, right? It's, it's definitely what we're trying to do with this school in the middle of Indiana where I'm helping them get a program started right now. And um, yeah, I think it's, it, you know, it's definitely the way to attract youth to our sport, at least by me, I feel like, you know, I feel like the sport is aging a bit, you know? Um, so how do we, how do we compete with these other sports and get, get young, younger people in, you know? Yeah. And that's always been uh, a, a common theme on the podcast so far is that sprint racing is the way to go. Like no matter yeah. what the discipline is, as long it is short, concise, it gets people's attention span. Yeah. Even in rowing, they go like 2000 meters. But in the grand scheme of things, that's not very far, especially sure. since they're going so fast. You can watch them start to finish, yeah. right? They go yeah. in heat. So the um, sprint style regattas, um, it's like, again, it's like the crossover on the Venn diagram with Dragon Boat. How yeah. do we race an OC6 like a Dragon Boat? They have a format for that, right? Yeah. You get the straightaway, you get the technical yeah. of the turn, one more straightaway. And I wish there were more outlets for that right like um an organization having four boats just like a dragon boat festival right you have four matching yeah. boats you put different teams in you can host a hundred teams as long as you have the four boats a trailer travel to a location and so on and um with the format being so short you can put literally new people in the boat and they're only paddling a few minutes as opposed to you know yeah. going to chattajack and good luck paddling for five hours right like hopefully <laughs> yeah. uh, survive at the end so I agree. I think the sprint format that they're doing there is cool. Again, there's a world champion level outlet for it. So if yep. you do it domestically, you race, you know, across the country, you can actually take that across the world and try to win something with it. And again, that's that, like you were talking about systems, it's a motivator, right? In a lot of the paddling we do, there is not a system that builds you up to a standardized world level competition unless it's very obscure or something. Right. So having something like that, that's a little linear. Again, it's a good motivator for all skill levels, new people and paddlers that have been around yeah. forever. Well, yeah. And it's, um, you know, I was just out at the Acora meeting and uh, that was one of the things we talked about. Right. Because there, there does, there does seem to be this, this interest in, in sprint racing. Um, you know, I think, I think there's a lot of clubs that are very much still love, I don't know what you'd call marathon racing, just longer race. I love change races. Um, but I, I definitely think that's that's the way to get get the youth in. And and so I think, you know, I hope, you know, Acora will keep talking about it. it that Jen was like, hey, Chicago would be a great place to have a race. And and I, I tend to agree with her, but you know, we we gotta figure that you gotta figure that out, right? Like um, I think we gotta build up, you know, what would be great is is if we could get some of the smaller clubs that come together to try to put that on for juniors. I think it'd be great, but I'm, I'm, I'm kind of hoping, like I said, we've been working with this school. It's called Culver Academy. They've got a summer program and they've added that last year, they added outrigger to it. And they had a bunch of, I think they had six, I think they had two OC ones and four OC twos. And um, we were able to get them two OC sixes for this summer. And Joe Laurel's coming out of Hawaii He's going to help coach the coaches. Um, I talked to Joey. Joey said he could, he'd also be willing to help, help, help me help coach these coaches. But if I think if we can get that program standing up and, and it's successful and others can see the success that comes from that, I think it'd be awesome, you know? So I'm going to so, start there and see where it goes. <laughs> What's yeah, your cat's I name? His name is Harry, and it's because he's missing hair from his eyelids to his head <laughs> on the side. So he's missed, he's got this stripe here. So we call yeah. him Harry. That's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so with the development and, uh, you know, sprint racing, getting kids into it and expanding it, what are some of the goals that you have for your organization going into the future and some of your personal goals as a coach, as an individual racer? and so yeah. on what are some of the future things that you have on the docket that you're looking on the horizon to yeah so um great question you know um i i think the biggest obstacle to outrigger canoeing was equipment mm -hmm. and um so i i kind of committed myself personally to take that obstacle away um like i said there's five canoes in chicago i 
owned or at one time owned and donated for those five canoes. Um, and, or no, actually there's six canoes now. Holy cow, six canoes. Um, and so five of those either I owned part, I owned or donated or, or bought. And, and it's just because I love this sport, right? Like it has given me so much, right? Traveled around the world, met amazing people. It probably helped me get through one of the darkest times of my life when I got divorced. Um, and so I just want to give back, right? And and so first and foremost, I want to create like a vibrant outrigger scene in, in, in the Midwest, but starting in Chicago. You know, Toronto's got something going, which is great. You know, I'd love to help something in Milwaukee, um, you know, maybe, maybe on the other side. Um, and, and so one, it was helping like 312 get started. Windy City just started. They've got an outrigger section now. And then my club and, and really, so I guess for my club, it's, it's just building a solid foundation so that it's, it's there and it will exist. Right. Um, we got a great board right now doing good things. We're, we're up to, I think 22 members. We were 25 last year, hoping those other three pay their dues <laughs> here quickly, but our goal is to get to 30 this year. Um, so build that up. So that's the first goal, right? Just, build up Outrigger Chicago so it stands on its own, um, help other clubs get started so we can build on our local race scene. Um, and then eventually I'd like to start, have a, like an OC6 race. Um, and I, that, I think that, that I'm 52 now, so my glory days are behind me. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. I, I've been, but I've been so focused on helping others get into the sport I've had to kind of, and my daughters play a very high level of sport. My my youngest plays AAA hockey, and my my oldest plays lacrosse in college. So I spent a lot of time watching their games, and it's which is great. They're way better athletes than me. But um, you know, I I think I could get back to maybe being competitive at, at the age at my age grade again. But um, you know, I I I want to. I feel it's my responsibility, right, to 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 give back to the sport everything it gave me. Right. And and I'm, I'm one of, it's crazy, but I'm one of the more knowledgeable people here in the Midwest. There's a, there's some really good people. And so I, I gotta, I gotta pass that on, right. The knowledge that others have taught me, I gotta pass that on. And that's what I'm trying to do. So that's, that's our focus, right. Just build it in Chicago. And Lake Michigan is amazing, right? Like every, we always get people somehow they found out about us, right. And they're from California or Hawaii or Florida. Like when Paulo came, he's like, holy cow, I had no idea the lake was like this. He was, he was loving it. Um, so the, the lake can be really ripping. Um, and um, but yeah, so it, it's a great place for outrigger canoeing, right? Like it's not, it's not like we're sitting on flat lakes. I mean, it's, you know, you can you can we can get good downwinders when it when the wind's blowing from the northeast. Man, it's fun. We pull surfboards out. You can go surfing in Chicago when the conditions are right. So, you know, it's a fun lake. Yeah, that's it, awesome you know, it's funny. You had uh, what was the guy's name? Uh, the surf ski champ, Joe Joe Sirkovich uh, from uh, yeah, he was from Chicago for a long I, time. Yeah, I never knew that. I learned that, and it was funny because he was like, Yeah, there's nobody that surf skis in Chicago, and I was like, What? Like, we used to have a race, like the mock brothers or the mocks were here racing, mm -hmm. and uh. But I think he came, I think he started in this time, like when things were kind of, it was a little goofy, right? It, it was, I think he said he started in 2017. And I think that was a, like, there was a Dragon Boat Worlds were on that year, you know, Outrigger Chicago, it, it kind of gotten smaller. And the guy that was running surf ski, Tim Flinty, you know, he, he, he got burned by the city in 2012 when they shut his race down because of weather. Oh, and I think that just kind of killed the momentum. So, but there's quite a few people that paddle surf ski now. So yeah, if you come uh, back, Joe, call me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, um, that region intersects a lot of ideas, right? So you have pretty big outrigger scene. Like you said, Lake Michigan, you can surf and downwind. Yeah. And I know a lot of people in the Michigan area and whatnot. And then you have ultra long distance racing with like yeah. the MR340 and that whole crowd yeah. where they do 50, 60, 70 mile races. The St. Charles Kayak and Canoe Club is right yeah. up the road, right? So there's all of these things that are going on. And most people don't think there's any paddling going on. Right. In and there's like everything you can imagine is in that little circle yeah. region. If you want to do it, there's something there for you. 
Yeah, for sure. Marathon canoe is, is like, I mean, when you think of marathon canoe, I think you think of the Midwest, like Michigan, you know, the Midwest, I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's a bunch of East coast paddlers that are going to be mad at me and go, no, no East coast too. But like, for sure. I think that's, that style of, of canoeing is, was probably our foundation, you know? So I got to say, um, I had Doug, I don't know how to say Doug's last name. It's like, it starts with a V, Vajko, Vajko. Vajko, yeah, Doug, yeah, Doug, yeah. So he recommended that you be on the show, and I'm super glad he reached out, because yeah. uh, having your demeanor and personality within the sport, right, there are, everything you're doing is what I'm trying to do as well, so we must be on the right path on yeah. growing it, sustaining it, and keeping it. Like you said, if you can give it to the next set of hands or the next generation, it can stay alive, right? When I die, they can't bury my paddle knowledge with me. I have to go out and give it away to the next person to keep it perpetuating, right? So yeah. there's there's a lot of parallels there, and uh, it's awesome. That it means that your area is destined to grow, and I hope you know it grows as a whole throughout the United States. Yeah, no, thanks. Uh, D Doug's been like he has been bitten by the outrigger bug so hard, and I love it. Right, like he's just. It's been so fun to watch him progress. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm not sure because he was a sub paddler mm -hmm. and he's brought a lot of the sub paddlers in, which has been really, really cool. But uh, yeah, no, you're right. Like, I mean, that's that's all we can do. Right. Is, is help others be successful, you know. Um, so it's great. It's awesome. Cool, my man. Thank you so much again for coming on to the uh, show. And that wraps up the, uh, I don't know what episode this is going to be, but this is a episode <laughs> XX of the uh, the Paddle Pursuit podcast. Thank you again so much for coming on. Yeah. Can I say one last thing? Absolutely. So if you find yourself in Chicago, you, Robert, or anyone else, right, uh, look us up, you know, front door is open, there's food on the table, and I got a canoe with your name on it. So please reach out. We'd love to take you out in our great lake. And, um, you know, we hope to see some of you out this way sometime. <laughs> Jeff, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, man. Later.